time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world-honored Longines. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope? Mr. William Bradford Huey, editor of the American Mercury, and Mr. Kenneth Kramer, executive editor of Business Week magazine. Our distinguished guest for this evening is Mr. Eugene S. Gregg of the United States Council International Chamber of Commerce. The opinions expressed are necessarily those of the speakers. Mr. Gregg, I suppose that uh, as a member of the executive uh, committee of the United States Council Chamber of Commerce, you are an American who's essentially interested in promoting world trade. Is that correct, sir? That is correct, because no country of the world is self-sufficient to itself, and it's only by having an expanding volume of international trade that we can hope to have the standards of living of the various peoples of the world raised. Well, our viewers have heard a number of programs uh, relative to the difficulties that have been caused by the Iron Curtains being drawn in the world. Now, sir, how does the Iron Curtain affect our allies in Western Europe? Our allies in Western Europe t traditionally got uh, a large percentage of their grains, uh, timber, timber products, coal, raw materials from Eastern Europe, and in turn paid for those uh, materials by the export to Eastern Europe of manufactured and semi-manufactured products. Now, what, once again, what are the, the products that, uh, that our, our friends in Western Europe need most badly from behind the Iron Curtain? They need wheat, they need coarse grains to feed cattle, to feed poultry, they need timber, timber products, mine props, uh, wood pulp, coal, raw materials. And are the nations of Western Europe getting some of those products now from, from Russia and the other nations behind the curtain? They're getting relatively small amounts today because of two factors. First, uh, the imperial amb ambitions of the communist Russians have put restrictions on what they will permit to go to Western Europe, and uh, our own governments, including the one in the ours in the United States, have also put restrictions on what can be exported behind the Iron Curtain. Well, we are concerned, aren't we, with uh, certain things that are being sent from Western Europe to uh, the countries behind the Iron Curtain at the present time? Uh, necessarily, if, uh, we, if any of those products uh, will definitely help the war potential uh, of the communists. But on the other hand, our allies in Europe are keenly interested in getting the foodstuffs and the raw materials that they so badly need. To simplify, in Europe, it's the problem of two enemies trading with one another, isn't it? That is correct. Each one's jockeying for advantage, but our allies very badly need timber and wheat and coarse grains. Now, if, and coal, uh, if they don't get it from Western, from uh, Eastern Europe, then uh, do we have to supply it? They have had to seek alternative sources, and uh, unfortunately, the sources where such materials are immediately available are nearly all dollar sources. They already have been short of dollars, and uh, being unable to get the cheap materials from behind the Iron Curtain aggravates their shortage of dollars. Now, uh, that, that means that uh, if, if they have to get it from us, we have to give them most of the dollars uh, to pay for it, don't we? That is what we have been doing uh, since the war and up to this time. To illustrate, sir, uh, a ton of coal that Italy needs, uh, if they get it from Poland, which is behind the Iron Curtain, uh, how much does Italy pay for Polish coal? About half what they would pay if the coal came from the United States. I see. In other words, they pay something like ten or eleven dollars a ton, and from us it would be twenty-three or twenty-four dollars a right. ton. So uh, we either have to let them get the coal from Poland, or else we have to sell it to them at twenty-four dollars a ton, and we have to give them uh, a lot of the dollars. Unless uh, we're willing to permit 
uh, our allies in Western Europe to sell more goods to us in this country and earn the dollars themselves. Well, now, that's, that's the problem. Now, uh, are you advocating or is your council advocating that that be done, <coughs> that more goods be sold in the United States? We think it would be in the interests of ourselves and of our allies if our trade barriers into this country could be lowered so that Europe could earn its way rather than to have us give money to them. Well, now, can that be done without uh, hardship to large groups of, of workmen uh, and investors in this country? If our trade barriers are materially reduced, unquestionably, there will be some hardship in some industries that have a vested interest in our present tariff or in some segments of the agricultural community. On the other hand, I think we tend to lose sight of the fact that the decade in which our tariff barriers were the highest was the decade in which we had the most massive unemployment we've ever had. Is there any other thing that we can do in order to help the situation? Would it help, for example, if Americans increased their investments abroad? It would help uh, if uh, Americans could do that. Uh, Americans are doing it in certain parts of the world where there is a free interchangeability of exchanges. For instance, Canada, Saudi Arabia, uh, Venezuela, even little Liberia. But those are regions that do not, uh, in particular, help the problem in Western Europe. Would it help any if we uh, had the government guarantee some of the investments that might be made in uh, Western Europe, for example? Our government at the present time uh, is doing a little of that, but in general, the business community with which I am familiar is not uh, very keen uh, about guarantees. That would then put us back in the place that the the primary salvation would be in getting more imports brought into this country from Western Europe. Yes, that seems to me uh, to be the best solution of the problem. And if it is difficult, if it is going to be difficult politically to get our trade barriers reduced, we may have to fall back on the device which is already established in some of our legislation of paying the industries or the segments of the agricultural community which are hurt by such a lowering of our barriers, a differential. We do that at the present time uh, for building ships, for operating ships. Now, do I understand you to say that the International Chamber of Commerce uh, might advocate uh, the extension of subsidy payments in this country? It is uh, studying the problem at this time, and this is one of the uh, possible solutions uh, in the interest of uh, diminishing the grants and aid in large quantities that we have been given, uh, giving abroad. Well, Mr. Gregg, I believe that our, our viewers would like you to repeat once again those three or four nations which seem to offer the best opportunities for American investment today. Uh, Canada, uh, where we are making huge investments in Labrador to bring out iron ore. Venezuela, where we have huge investments in oil and are now making large investments to bring out iron ore. Saudi Arabia, where we have huge investments uh, to bring out petroleum. And Little Liberia, uh, we are making investments there to bring out iron ore. But there are large areas in the world today that uh, that uh, don't seem to offer much opportunity to American capital. That's correct. Now, on the point of trade, uh, is there anything that might be done or that should be done in addition to the reduction of tariffs that would uh, result in a lowering of trade barriers? Well, we have had uh, in this country for a number of years the so-called uh, reciprocal trade treaty legislation which uh, has resulted in uh, the lowering of some of the barriers, but there will have to be a more vigorous attack on barriers uh, than is possible under existing legislation if Europe uh, is given an opportunity really to earn her way in this country. 
Isn't there also a certain amount of uh, red tape in connection with customs that might uh, be eliminated that would help to promote a freer flow of trade? Yes, uh, the trade barriers in this country are not so much the duties uh, that are in our tariff legislation as the procedures in our tariff legislation having to do with uh, fixing the value on which duties are to be assessed and the way in which those duties are assessed. Well, Mr. Gregg, we've said a good deal now about the Iron Curtain in Western Europe. I'm sure that our viewers would appreciate your telling us a little something about the trade problem in Japan and, the, and in Asia. Uh, there is a problem in Japan that is as serious as that in Western Europe. Japan uh, formally got practically all of her coal, iron ore, manganese, uh, a great part of her foodstuffs from Manchuria and North China. Today, uh, Japan cannot uh, get these materials from those sources, and the problem before the Western democracies, if they wish Japan to stay with them, is where can Japan get these materials? Well, sir, I, I believe then that to, to simplify, uh, this is true, isn't it? That the world is simply divided into two parts, and as long as those two curtains are there, we're going to have these terrible trade problems, aren't we? Oh, yes. And uh, uh, do you see any, any chance or any indication that this problem may be lessening any, that the, that the Russians and, and their group may be less recalcitrant in the future? Well, I don't, uh, I think that the pot shouldn't call the kettle black uh, in the restrictions but, uh, through the Iron Curtain. I think we have been just about as severe as the Russians have. But at any rate, I, our viewers can expect that this problem will remain with us for, for quite a while and it's going to be a very difficult one to solve. Oh, there's no question about that. Well, thank you, Mr. Gregg, very much for being with us tonight, sir. The editorial board for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope was... Mr. William Bradford Huey and Mr. Kenneth Kramer. Our distinguished guest was Mr. Eugene S. Gregg of the United States Consul International Chamber of Commerce. If there's one reason, above all, above all others, why so many people want to buy Longines watches, that reason is confidence. William Pitt once said, Confidence is a plant of slow growth. The great confidence in the Longines watches of today matured from the excellent performance of millions of Longines watches over the past 86 years. That same performance that has won for Longines watches in open competition with the world's leading watches, 10 World's Fair grand prizes, 28 gold medals, and countless honors for accuracy from the leading government observatories has also won for Longines the title of the world's most honored watch. The beauty, the good taste of every Longines watch is self-evident. The years have proved that any Longines watch can be purchased with confidence, that it will deliver in full measure the greater accuracy and longer life for which Longines watches are world honored. Longines, the world's most honored watch, premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company. Since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. We invite you to join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday evening at this same time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, broadcast on behalf of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. This is Frank Knight, reminding you that Longines and Whitnor watches are sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem, Agency for Longines Whitnor Watches. You beat the clock on the CBS television network.